Hello all and welcome back to Paradigm Shift. I'm Jonathan Lover, Instructor of Product Marketing for TradeShift and your host for this event. In our final session today, we're talking about the, the economics of supply chain resilience and whether or not they are as adaptive as they need to be in a post-COVID world. Today's chat will tackle the question of what's next for the global economy. You know, 18 months ago, most people didn't know what a supply chain was, let alone how interruptions in them could wreak havoc in our daily lives. Now, supply chains are in the headlines and in the news almost daily as, as container ships continue to clog busy ports and everything from cars to, to dishwashers seem to have been impacted by the shortage of, uh, of silicon chips. Today, our speakers have been thinking about the issues uh, that we're going to discuss for years, uh, decades even. They continue to work tirelessly to come up with solutions to problems they see as critical to creating a, a more fair and balanced business world. Uh, actually, uh, uh, oh, the world as a whole. Uh, so Christian Lang, TradeShift CEO, believes in the power of a network platform to help companies digitize and automate their processes so they can grow to their fullest potential. Rob Van Eipenberg founded his company, Quintess, with the mission to simplify the ch supply chain through collaboration. Now let's hear what Christian and Rob have to say about how the economics of supply chain resilience still work in a post-pandemic world. Guys. Hey Rob, uh, good, good to be chatting again. How did we end up in this mess where suddenly um, we have queues for gasoline in uh, UK, we talk about not getting all the Christmas deliveries done. Like, it seems supply chain has been a well-oiled machine for many decades now, and suddenly it's just it's just wobbly and, and, and not really working the way it used to. What, what, what's happening? Well, you know, like I think we'll say supply chain resilience is sort of like a buzzword at this point in time, and we've been very lucky of like as global supply chains to be shielded uh, quite a lot, actually, let's say, from any disruptions. Obviously, let's say COVID, you know, like was a big game changer of that. People have been, practitioners have been talking about supply chain resilience before, but the typical scenario that people were preparing for was a local flooding in some country, you know, or maybe let's say a power plant or a nuclear power plant in some area not being available anymore. Those were the type of scenarios that people played with to test the resilience of their supply chain. And this was just like a different order of magnitude. And I did not don't know any customers that were prepared and had the playbook together um, at that point in time to deal with a global pandemic, to be honest. So we prepared a theory for a long time, right? Like, I mean, everybody, every company in the world have these crisis plans and risk plans, and, but but it was all really built for local disruption, right? Maybe an event in China, maybe something happened, the flooding, as you say, and so on. But, but the system never really tried a global stress test, right? Like a global pressure. What's very interesting is that it seems that you know a lot of the a lot of the sort of policies in place, as you said, we might mostly have been shielded. So even though as we as the consumers and the press make a big point out of, of um, things being uh, missing in supermarkets and so on, and in fact that's actually maybe the best case scenario, right? Like you said, we, we actually got shielded a lot from what it could have been. What's the take on that? Yeah, well, I think you know like what I see is that like. This pandemic, it showed that the structure of the supply chain is also essential to that. Like if I just look at like some customer cases, it worked out very differently. If you want like one of our customers, like typical the manufacturer of a first tier manufacturer of, uh, air, uh, of airspace equipment, delivering to air framers like Boeing um, and Airbus, you know, they suddenly saw their demands fall away because Actually, let's say those guys were not building airplanes anymore uh, suddenly and as we're seeing their order book uh, completely cancelled. So for them, the impact was actually very different from one of our other customers, joint customers, which is in the fast moving consumer goods, where people, even if they were working from home, they continue to eat yogurt. But actually, let's say the disruptions which were much more actually on the supply chain, supply side of the of the supply chain, and I think like this dual way, you know, like this, this dual-edged sword, and the way it worked out in different supply chains in a very different way, 
was definitely a level of complexity um, that people had not really anticipated that that could happen. And it's, it's very interesting, right, because I think central banks and governments have a lot of experience through, you know, the financial crisis, the pandemic, all of this in dealing with demand shock, right? I mean, essentially what we just do is we crank up the money machine and, and, and generate some, some, some liquidity for the markets or lower the interest rate. And, and that's worked very well for, for the last 20 years. But we don't really have a lot of effective government inventions, interventions or, um, or central bank interventions for, for supply chain shocks, right? Because in fact, some of the things we do on the consumer side to, to make sure the demand is there or, or the demand side might make things worse on, on, the, demand, on the supply side, right? We, we saw that with logistics, right? There was a huge pileup of logistics and prices just went through the roof. And so, so it seems like all of the techniques we know, at least from a government or a central level, to deal with this kind of crisis don't really work so well for supply chain sharks. And, and one thing I thought was interesting is that the whole system actually, especially on the inventory, had a very hard time. I mean, you all talk about resilient supply chains. And, and what do resilient supply chains really mean? Well, that means having inventory when, when stuff drops off that's critical to your production, right? Or it means having multiple suppliers for the same goods and, and so on. And, and I think, you know, every CEO is out there telling the CFOs and, and everybody else, you got to make sure we're resilient, but by the way, don't increase our, our cost of inventory, right? So how do we solve that riddle? That's an interesting point. You hear these type of, uh, let's say, ideas that, okay, yeah, we work with just-in-time deliveries. Um, so, you know, like, we should, we should we give up actually on just-in-time uh, delivery, just-in-time deliveries. Um, personally, let's say, from my observation with clients, that's not let's say, really going to be feasible because not only looking at say the supply chain and the logistics in that area but if you just like look at the, you know the, the layout of the sites that we're talking about they wouldn't physically let's say have space to store parts for three weeks or something like that it would just like take them like 10 years to rebuild factories to orient to, to work in that model so the type of responses let's say that that, that we've seen that we are seeing in that area is that like people you know look at different ways of working and you know i'm sometimes actually let's say uh, calling it like tightening the fabric of the supply chain so that actually let's say they become let's say more resilient uh, to these type of changes and that they can deal with that let's say in a different way and then obviously let's say if you're single sourced from one supplier you're more exposed in terms of the risk uh, so what we see people doing is starting to use the trade shift network in more creative ways and for example you know like work with multi-source have access to a larger number of suppliers than they would maybe lead say traditionally work with what i also see is that what people you know what people try to think of like okay we're going to bring this to like offshoring to low-cost countries and things like that so rather than actually let's say talking about nearshoring and for example, bringing your manufacturing to Eastern Europe, they're actually let's say, looking at different type of options to say, well, shouldn't we like look more with these suppliers to extend, let's say, the capabilities so that we could do things like co-manufacturing so that a supplier, which maybe was only supplying parts, actually let's say, starts to supply us also, let's say, with components or with, 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 with sub-assemblies and that we incorporate that, you know, in the, that we incorporate that in, um, in, into the overall picture. So rather than actually, let's say, doing that, like, you know, like building the factory ourselves, actually make use of the real time and the digital collaboration that we have with these manufacturers to actually increase, let's say, these to, to increase this resilience. And, you know, that's like a, a couple of things that I'm seeing that they can still push the inventories away because inventories yeah. are a financial aspect, but they also have other types of risk, you know, like especially with demand fluctuations, you know, like very unstable markets, especially like for electronics, but also for capital goods that if you've got the wrong inventory of the wrong stuff, then finally you're not selling it because you see demand patterns changing, that's not necessarily helping you either, right? Even if you can fund yeah. it at 0% interest, I mean, you've got still got risks of obsolescence, um, of having bought the wrong stuff, uh, 
which is also, let's say, not going to, let's say, which is not going to increase the problem, even if you can borrow at zero yeah, percent. I think I think you're making some really good points here. And I think you know what's what's interesting, right? Is we both run cloud computing software companies, and obviously, the Tracy platform we're globally distributed. We we use data centers around the world, and we have all of these services to make sure that we're running twenty four seven. And and you know, in a way, you can look at that as you have the companies have outsourced the management and inventory of servers, right? They used to have all of these servers in the basement and running everything themselves. But whenever there was a demand spike, say tens of thousands of visitors to a website, or you know, they would have to have additional capacity. So instead, what they did was they outsourced the capacity and built, like in a way, a cloud solution is just an aggregate pool of inventory, right? And and you know, my customers would certainly not be happy if I said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm out of compute. This one supplier I have to deliver, um, we're going to be back in a week, right? Like, no, nobody would, 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 would say that was acceptable. And I think the point to that is these solutions where we can maybe pull some of the inventory, pull some of the manufacturing capacity. And, and that goes to, to what you just mentioned with the Tracheef Network, where we've seen a huge uptick in, in customers coming in and being interested is actually around marketplaces. Because in a way, you know, you can take a, a chunk of, of your supply chain and instead put it in a marketplace. Well, then you can actually have multiple suppliers doing the same. Um, and a lot of the single sourcing in the past had to do with two things, really, just administrative cost and, and price. But marketplaces are pretty effective drivers of those. So you can have more inventory available. You can have more players available. And, and in a way, you're just doing with your inventory and your supply chain what you did with cloud computing for the last 10 years, right? You're, you're pulling the supply. Uh, so I thought, you know, that's one area that's that's quite interesting to see happening. And I think there's actually a lot that we can learn from our supply chain designs in how we're building cloud computing and, and the architectures that we've been using. Uh, and another thing you mentioned right there it was what we call the tightening of the fabric. I mean, in, in cloud computing, we talk about microservices, which means we have a lot of services doing the same all over. And in, in supply chains, right, I mean, you're right, like, um, you know, if you're a car manufacturer, you cannot store three weeks of supply of, of, of uh, chassis or steel or whatever you need at your site, right? But maybe you could have some backup producers much closer, right? That that are sort of like microservices close to your manufacturing in the case that the global link breaks, you can still keep a supply going. So I think it's very interesting, especially also because robotic manufacturing, uh, uh, all of these things are much, much cheaper today than they were 20 years ago. So the, the cost of having some additional production capacity closer is probably a tenth of it was uh, 10 years ago, right? So, so I'm very curious to see how, how these models are going to evolve. Yeah, no, definitely true. So but, yeah, like Tracer also has like a lot of logistics service providers on the platform. And obviously, let's say they also play a role um, in this availability of product. And some of the delays are not just between buyers and sellers and manufacturers, you know, like and, 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 and OEMs or other let's say people actually say using those components. So, you know, like what's your perspective actually of, of their role into this, if you talk about this distribution um, of capacity and actually and, 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 and leveraging uh, that capacity. Um, it's like it's because I think let's say customers what I see, let's say interesting like if you look at our numbers, I see actually we see a post we saw purchase orders going up, let's say pretty quickly from our customers. We actually even saw dispatches from suppliers going up with some delay and of course with some hiccups and suppliers not being able to make dispatches. But if you then you know look at the other side of the platform again, the goods receivings actually they lag behind. So which says actually let's say there's you know like apparently although like we're collaborating on these transactions, on the purchase orders, suppliers are actually responding to the return of the demand and the demand spikes to the extent that they're capable to do that. We're handling the exceptions. If they're not able to do that, finding alternative manufacturers. But then, hey, we still got like this black hole of transportation and apparently it'll say some stuff is actually being dispatched by the suppliers but somewhere not moving, either in a port or in a warehouse, or maybe stuck in the Suez Canal, I don't know, um, you know, like before it shows up. So how could like the supply chains really collaborate in that triangle with logistics service providers and where to see the role of the creative platform in that? So you obviously are putting me a little bit on <laughs> on the spot here. And, and the reason I'm saying this is I think we have pretty much every major logistics company in the world as a customer. 
Uh, so, so everything I say now, uh, and, and for those of our customers who are listening, you know me well, so I'm saying this with love, right? Like, uh, but I also speak truth. I think in the beginning of the pandemic, the logistics companies had a, a hard time, right? Because a lot of a lot of shipments were dropping off. And then in the tail end of the pandemic, it went the other way. And, and clearly, obviously, they needed to recover from that early phase. So, so prices shot up uh, dramatically. And, and I think they were in a good position to do that. But I also think that a lot of companies found out that even when they had the capacity production-wise, even when they had the inventory around the world, not being able to move it was a strategic risk for them, right? So if you're a fast-moving consumer goods company, as we just discussed, or a car manufacturer or an air part manufacturer, um, airplane part manufacturer, if you're in a situation where you have the inventory, you have the goods, you can actually deliver to your customer's contracts as you said, the POs, shut up. But you cannot get there because of a, of the, the clocking of the, the logistics piece. You're going to take note. And I think you're going to see a lot of Fortune 500 companies be a lot more thoughtful and will probably require a lot more from the logistics partners in the sense of managing that inventory, have much more direct control of where it is and transparency into that, transparency into dispute resolution if there's something happening along their shipment they don't have. And, and today, that transparency is pretty slim, right? I get a track and trace code, but I don't really know what's happening. So I think uh, in the space of, of virtual cockpits into your supply chain, being able to see the different logistics chains and how they impact your you know, delivery ability to, to your customers is going to be crucial, right? And, and something we will see last customers demand across the world, because if not, it's just a too big strategic risk to sit with on, on your books and, and not know what's happening, right? Yeah, no, and for then I think that there's actually let's say, a tremendous opportunity to increase, uh, let's say that, to, to increase that, to, to, to increase the resilience and, you know, like, and, 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 and work with a platform like TradeShift where like everybody is connected to the same process, not only just like a transactional conversation between A and B, and then I have another transactional conversation between A and C, and I have another, you know, transactional conversation between B and C, but actually to simultaneously I will say do that in a real time basis. I think that is like a big game changer for um, for to, to, to increase resilience uh, in the supply chain. I don't think it's accident that last year we brought out our carrier collaboration app and actually let's say our uh, improvements to our e-logistics app um, as well as the planner workbench because they they actually sit in the middle of that triangle and the fact that we trade you we've got real time access to the fleet of these parties and get them have them around the table or even have four parties around the table of the, like there's like somebody else doing the warehousing and somebody else doing the transportation uh, i think we'll say that's like the big game changer to increase that resilience rather than try to solve that into one-to-one -to -one conversations like having whatsapp and you know having a conversation with one person and actually having multiple group chats and, and, and exchanging, let's say, like all, all that tape, all of the type of information with all the parties that need to be involved, actually, let's say, to resolve that, to resolve that situation. And I think, like, you know, like that's one of the ways where maybe, actually, let's say, like, you know, logistics and supply chain um, becomes part of, can become part of the solution instead of being part of the problem. I think that's spot on. And, and, and in fact, I was just thinking, you know, Gartner introduced, I think it was like six or seven years ago, this idea of supply chain grids instead of supply chain, you know, portals or solutions. And I think, you know, it was a really powerful idea. And I think it last part trade shift is, is such a grid, which means it's not just that as a customer, I can talk one-to-one -one with my supplier. No, you can create cross collaboration across the supply chain when it's needed for coordination, right? And, and you are of course in control of, of where you set up that collaboration and how it works. but. But what always I think was was the question to, to Gartner's big vision around this this idea of a supply chain grid was, well, what's going to be the trigger? Event? But why are we going to change? Right? There needs to be a reason to change. And in some way, I think a lot of this, not just the pandemic, but also what we see the Brexit, what we see with China, is really amplifying that situation and driving uh, a lot of change. The the other part of the equation you yeah, can start thinking about is another challenge with, with this resilient piece is we kind of have a a, a double whammy because. A lot of CFOs are telling, telling their suppliers to say, well, guys, we need resilience, so you need to stock up on your inventory. I'm not going to do it. You're going to do it. 
And, and by the way, at the same time, we're going to take our DP, uh, uh, payment terms up to 90 days, 120 days, and so on. So for the suppliers, they essentially get hit on both sides, right? They're getting pushed to having more inventory and they're getting pushed to getting uh, paid later. And, and that's a really, really bad cocktail. So I think that's the other thing that I think is a little worse from in the days that we have is we're seeing POs rack up like crazy. Invoices are coming in, but the payment terms are much longer than they used to be. And, and I think we need to think a lot more creatively around how we get working capital and finance out to these suppliers because that needs to be part of the equation. Uh, if not, then, then you're just going to stretch or break your, your supply chain or, or introduce additional risk at a risky time, right? Yeah, that's very interesting. Also, that's a very interesting observation. I think you know, like, that could maybe also potentially have an effect. I mean, we're in direct materials and in supply chain. The average price of a PO is definitely also like 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 pretty high, right? I mean, um, uh, it's probably like around six thousand, seven thousand um, so euros uh, on all, on average. Uh, so I would say, and with many suppliers, like the total volumes of spent on an annual basis are in the hundred thousands of euros. What you typically have seen is that solutions that have been offered in that area is like factoring type things, like, you know, like based on invoices. But, you know, like by the time the invoice gets issued, it's, it's a bit late actually, let's say, into the game because you already need to commit to like buy raw materials uh, from sub suppliers and these type of things way ahead of this. So one of the things actually that, that we're seeing as an opportunity is to say, well, if you have supply chain grids, you know, as you just mentioned it, like, like trade shift, then you also can give like visibility and traceability um, on things like purchase orders or goods being dispatched um, or maybe even on forecast in some cases. I mean, you know, like to a funder, um, you know, those could be just as good as collateral um, maybe actually as the invoices, because maybe yeah. actually, let's say, maybe actually, let's say the invoice, you know, I guess like to a very, from a very small supplier from which you have very relatively little data, whereas actually the buyer is maybe a reputed company and you know that eventually you will get the money there. So I think that also maybe give some fuel to the ideas of extending supply chain finance from invoicing to either, you know, like purchase orders or call-offs or maybe even actually, let's say, a delivery schedule or a forecast um, as a foundation to, to offset um, those, to offset those payment terms. Yeah, and I, I think it's actually worse than that, right? Because you mentioned the PO or the invoice, but the invoice is getting issues, and this is especially in direct materials, clearly, right? Like when the invoice is getting issues, it's too late. You already had all of the manufacturing costs. But it's actually worse than that, right? Because most supply chain finance solutions today don't even give you money when the invoice is issued, but when it's approved. And, and for a lot of companies, that might be two, three, four weeks before that approval comes. So, so and then the other thing is, right, most supply chain finance solutions in the market today, they focus on the largest suppliers. And this is ironic because while that from a, from a strategic perspective might make sense, if you look at working capital as a risk mitigation solution for your supply chain, and if you look at it as an inventory increase or resilience solution, that it's the middle you should focus on, right? That's where the suppliers get stressed liquidity-wise. I mean, the last guys, they're not going to get as stressed as, as the middle. So so I think, uh, and, and of course, some of the things we've been trying to do in, in, in exactly this area is to use the real-time data to, to issue financing on the day of the issuance of the invoice or in the future, hopefully very soon, on the PO, but also being able to, to target the middle because it's a completely digital solution. We don't need to sit and sign up a lot of paperwork for every single supplier and so on. So I think it, it's really time to think about working capital and supply chain finance as resiliency solutions and not just as a treasury thing where we say, okay, this is a little bit of a way of, of gaining some DPOs and, and you know, it, it's actually a resiliency tool because if you can get working capital to your mid-tier suppliers, uh, well, then you also have an argument for increasing inventories and you're de-risking their whole position, right? That's a very good point to tie, let's say, the, the, the financial supply chain to the physical supply chain. One maybe fun fact actually around it, one of our joint customers is global leader in farming equipment. They actually did that during the pandemic. So they're invoicing, like that they're using solutions for our solution for ordering, dispatching, and using trade shift pay, right, for invoices. And they actually will say shortened 
for their smaller suppliers. So everybody that did below 500,000 in revenue, they shortened the payment terms, but only for the small suppliers, just actually to prevent, you know, the yeah. problem that, 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 that you were talking about. So it was not third party finance, to be honest, it was sort of like instant measure that they take to support their smaller suppliers. But they actually would say started to fund them faster based on the invoice being submitted and actually would say not on the invoice being approved. So it was just like a little in, in that area to put to make that point. I actually saw that happening. Yeah, I, I, I think actually almost maybe to summarize a little bit of our conversation here, right? Is what we're saying is that think about resilience is not just one department's function, right? It's not resilience is not something procurement can solve or no. AP or planning or, or treasury, right? In fact, if you start to think about resilience, you really need to think across all of those departments. And that is very, very hard if the ways that you're interacting and engaging with your supply chain is siloed into 20 different tools, right? Absolutely. Because, yeah. so, so, so I think, you know, this is where the, the digital networks, they really make a difference because you can actually go and say, okay, well, we, we're using, you know, Quintus for the direct materials, we're using trade to pay for payment process and we are running a marketplace on our inventory side, and by the way, then we have a holistic working capital solution across all of these that allows us to to take a look at what's going on in trend. And and I think you know when it comes to resiliency design, you, you cannot just say, oh, it's about making some checks in the supplier and resource from them, right? Or uh, so, so I think tools like what you just mentioned, showing in the payment terms for the smaller guys, that's almost unheard of in the treasury. Like they, they always go the other way, right? Because that's the job. Um, but but I think. If you think holistically about it, you have a lot more tools uh, how to, to approach that, right? Yeah, and I think the next thing I'm going to think of then, Christian, is to, to actually make this thing multi-scenario so that we can also have different playbooks and, and actually also have a sandbox environment where we can actually run different playbooks in that, uh, in that area. Because I think that's also yeah. one of the things, you know, like, who saw this coming? And what will be coming next? Because we talked about COVID, but you know, like I think you can look at other things as well, right? I mean, political instability. I mean, there are many other things actually that, that impact resilience of supply chains, isn't it? Absolutely right. And, and I think, you know, I mean, in fact, I think we have designed supply chains to solve for economic conditions. But I think what we've got to realize today, I mean, 2021, if, if we are honest, is that the way that we design these supply chains to solve for economic conditions might have had unplanned impacts on climate, on socioeconomic things in countries, right? So, you know, it's in no company's interest anywhere in the world that you're seeing political instability. But but we also gotta ask ourselves is is the way that we designed and planned and managed our supply chains maybe sometimes the, the part of this this instability or part of these issues of climate. So so I think as we think long term planning on the long horizon, I think we really need to plan across all three dimensions. A really good point on that is, you know, everything that we've seen right now in the pandemic, I mean, that's pretty much just a trial run of a lot of the disruptions we're going to see from climate change. And, and climate change is not going to be one big hairy thing happening overnight, right? It's going to be water problems in, uh, I sit in the Western US right now, where we have the biggest drought in, in like the last 30 years. It's going to be floodings like you saw in, in Northern Europe and so on. So, so a lot of what we, we've been dealing with during the pandemic is just a trial run for disruptions we'll see in the future. And I think we need to do two things. We need to have capacity for change. We need to have an agile supply chain where we can change very quickly, but we also need in our planning to think about how do we mitigate some of these effects in the longer run. And they are, you know, economic, uh, climate and, and, and socioeconomic that, that we need to mitigate. Right? Very good, I agree. On that big thought, uh, maybe it's a, it's a good point to wrap up. So. Uh, Obviously, if you want to talk to, more to us about any of these things, uh, I think uh, most of us know how to reach us. And uh, really, uh, thank you for, for tuning in. Yeah, thank you for the invite. Uh, it was really so good to exchange thoughts on this with you, uh, Christian. Thank you, Christian and Rob, for that analysis. I, for one, will be doing some further research into some of the topics covered, as I imagine quite a few people will hear. But that, you know, but that's part of the fun in listening to two people who are so deeply engaged in the work they love. You know, as we wrap up today's conversations, gang, I think it's important to reflect on how much has changed in the world of supply chains and the kind of questions this has forced to the forefront of people's minds. With the busy holiday season coming up, how will global commerce handle the pressure? 
As the pandemic subsides, will we find a way to build resilience into supply chains permanently? You know, how far should businesses go in their efforts to build resilience? And how far can they go before the cost ends up making them unprofitable uh, and unworkable? As enterprises who do business in this arena, our collective answer to this is critical in creating the kind of world we want to live in. A world where everyone everywhere has equal access to trade. Think about that. Until next time, this is Jonathan Lovrens from Trade Shift signing off. Happy shifting.